I like to, <laughs> I like to think of this as a cross pollination opportunity. You're being cross pollinated with ideas from Arizona, and I'm going to learn things from talking to you guys in Virginia. Um, I wanted to point out that botany is one of the oldest sciences. People have been studying plants since we began eating them so long time ago. So um, botany is a subject that has a lot of depth to it, and it's difficult to know everything about botany. So you'll run into people who are experts. Don't let that intimidate you. Jump right in and see what you can learn as well. Master gardeners are gardeners who use science and uh, have success that way. Come on. All right. Ideally, what should be happening now is my slide should be progressing. There we go. Okay, so today we're going to get a bit of a drink from a fire hose. A lot of information is going to be coming at you fairly quickly. Um, you're going to get a lot of new words because like every science, botany has its own terminology. Don't let the words throw you. The words are usually based on Latin or Greek. Um, that was the language of the day when botany got started. So um, they wanted to be sure that people all over the world would be able to share this information. That's why they used Latin, which was very widespread at one point in our uh, civilization process. So I want to start out by telling you some of the principles of botany that we're going to be delving more deeply into. And the first I want to start with is the fact that plants are autotrophs. And an autotroph is a self-feeder. In other words, plants make their own food. They use the miracle of photosynthesis. They take the sunlight. They take a wonderful molecule called chlorophyll. And they are able to fix carbon from carbon dioxide and create the byproducts of a sugar, which is good for the plant, and oxygen, which is good for us. Plants are incredibly diverse. There are thousands and thousands of plants. And to be able to study one, you will find out that everything you learn might not apply to another plant, or you might find exceptions to the rules. Plants are diverse. Plant growth, like human growth, is governed by hormones. These hormones act different, differently depending on the target tissues. And uh, it's kind of a universal concept that plant growth and animal growth are both controlled by hormones. Plants function by maintaining a balance of energy between the top part of the plant and the roots of the plant. These are imbalanced. They're not equal, but a change in one means that you're going to have a change in the other. Plants that are related share growth characteristics. We are going to really nail down some of the differences in plants and some of the commonologies of plants. When plants are related by family, we find that their growth characteristics are the same. They're going to need the same kind of soil requirements. They're going to need, they're going to be bothered by the same insect pests. They're going to be bothered by the same diseases. So if you learn what kind of relationship your plant has, what family it's in, you're going to be better able to grow it because that's really what we're all about. We're trying to help grow, plants grow and thrive. All plants share a drive to reproduce, and humans exploit that drive quite a bit. Have you ever deadheaded a flower? Well, you're telling that plant that it no longer has seeds. It needs to get busy and produce some more flowers. I wanted to point out that animals are heterotrophs. They do not make their own food. Plants make their own food autotrophs. Jumping right in into photosynthesis, you will see that this is a cross section of a chloroplast, which is a structure in a plant cell that holds all of the chlorophyll. And these structures that look like pancakes, they are holding the molecules of chlorophyll. They're holding um, all the raw ingredients together. And through the magic of sunlight, which excites certain chemicals, carbon dioxide can be utilized with water and fixed to form 
oxygen and sugars. And guys, I'm wondering if you can hide, I'm gonna hide this because I want you guys to be able to see more of the slide. So with the byproduct of oxygen, this is able, enables our bodies to breathe. So we're looking at plants providing oxygen and providing a food source for animals. Animal and plant differences go down all the way to the cellular level. On the left, we have an animal cell. The animal cell has a non-rigid membrane around it. It has a nucleus, it has cytoplasm. And as we look over here at the plant cell, right away we see the biggest difference is it has a cell wall. This cell wall is very strong and it's fortified with lignin and cellulose and it helps the plant maintain its structure. In the center of this plant, you find a large vacant area called a vacuole. This vacuole is a storage place for a plant. It's also, you may also find a vacuole in animal cells, but it's usually not quite as large as the vacuole in a plant cell. This vacuole contains a lot of materials, but primarily it contains water. And you will notice that when a plant wilts, what happens is water has left these vacuoles in many, many cells, and the cell itself starts to be a little bit more flexible. It wilts all the way from the cell level up. I wanted to point out that these are the chloroplasts that we looked at before. This is where photosynthesis is happening. And uh, this is basically the big difference between plants and animals. They can make their own food in these chloroplasts, and they have a very rigid cell wall, which helps their structure, and they have this internal vacuole, which allows that plant cell to wilt a little bit. And the plants will use that for other purposes, as we'll see later on. Humans, in our wisdom, have separated plants into a lot of different groupings. And I wanted to point out that these are human specified groupings. They are not anything that the plants participated in. So for that reason, they turn, they change periodically. And we have these that are subject to change. And one of the reasons that is, is they were grouped, first of all, by what they look like and things that look similar or had similar structures were grouped together as we get into our more lofty type of analysis of plant we're looking at the dna we're looking at the genetics of the plant and we're finding out that sometimes they're not related the way we thought they were so those of us who have spent a lot of years memorizing all those plants now have to change our thought patterns and fit them into a different structure. So this particular tree of plants is actually a moment in time. It changes quite a bit. And I wanted to point out that this particular tree goes from simple to complex. It's one of the um, talking points of evolution that plants and animals go from a very simple, single-celled state up to a more and more complicated state. So down here at the base of the plant, we're starting with some ancestral green algae. These are some of the earliest plant-like organisms that formed. And as we move up this tree, changes start occurring. We start with some mosses and liverworts. Those are fairly uh, simple plants, and then we move up into ferns, which were a little bit more complicated. As we get up into the gymnosperms, we are now in the seeded plants. And gymnosperms are plants that reproduce with cones. Angiosperms are all the flowering plants. Gymnosperms have about a thousand different genuses in it, as opposed to an angiosperm, which is up around 300,000. So quite a lot of diversity over here in the angiosperms. First of all, let me try to get rid of this. Uh, I'm really 
really sorry to get rid of this bar up at the top. But um, first in our plant life came algae. Those are the early plants. Algae are single-celled and multi-celled organisms. They float on water. They're entirely dependent on water. And floating on the surface of the water, they are able to capture the sun energy through photosynthesis. You can see the little chloroplasts here um, on the plant and create a lot of oxygen. For a long time, algae was just about it on the planet until they started to build up enough concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere we started to have some other forms of life being able to, to grow. After the algae came these earlier plants, bryophytes, liverworts, mosses, and hornworts. These are non-vascular plants. And by the vascular system, I mean the piping system inside a plant that will bring water from the roots up to the leaves, that will bring sugar from the leaves down to the roots, that basically act as a vascular system, just like our veins in our body. So as you look at mosses and liverworts, you may see that this looks a little bit like a leaf. There's no midrib here. There is no vein. This may look like a root, but there's no differentiation between the different cells. In other words, there are no specialized cells in these groups. These plants colonize the land, but they are still highly dependent on water, in dry situations, you do not get a lot of mosses. We come up to the next step with ferns. These guys are seedless, so they are reproducing by spores, but finally they have a vascular system. So with a vascular system, you do not have to have all of your cells in fairly close contact with water. You can actually pipe the water to the cells in the plants, which is what happens with the vascular system. Ferns are very much dependent still on rainwater. They have to be, that's how their spores are spread. That's how um, fertilization between the spores takes place and their reproduction. The difference between a spore and a seed is that a spore is single-celled, where a seed is multi-celled and has a lot of differentiation in the cell. The seed revolution is next. Gymnosperms. These guys were about the first guys to get started. Ginkgo biloba is a very old plant called a maidenhair tree. And cycads are another example. A cycad forms a cone when it is getting ready to reproduce. Um, and I wanted to point out that you will see different words here. Maidenhair tree, ginkgo biloba, Cycus revoluta, sago palm. What you're seeing here is the scientific name and the common name. The common name changes a lot depending on what part of the world you're in. But if you know the scientific name, you have that plant nailed down. No one else is going to have a different scientific name unless it's a more recent change to the name. So you can pretty much talk. Cycus revoluta with um, other people in other parts of the world, and you're talking about the same plant. The importance of seeds cannot be understated. Seeds allowed plants to colonize the land, and they are able to survive in a difficult environment. They are seeds that they have unearthed from Pharaoh's tombs. They're 2,000 years old, and they've been able to get them to sprout. So a seed is a highly resistant form of the plant life. Our most familiar gymnosperm is probably the conifer. Conifers include things like pine trees and firs and hemlocks and cypress. They are massive, they're long living, they're very, very successful. They are able to use their wonderful vascular system to take water up 300 feet and take more up to the top of the leaves to keep the leaves hydrated. The leaves are modified as needles or scales in conifers, and they are a couple of different kinds of cones on most of the conifers. You have the male cones, which produce the pollen, and the female cones, which hold the seed. 
these are all wind pollinated. So you don't see any showy flowers here, your cones instead. And gymnosperm actually means naked egg. So what's going on here is you do not have anything covering this seed. You have a, a small banner to help it be dispersed in the wind, but there is no casing for the seed. There's not a juicy apple around that seed. So that covers a little bit about the conifers. Angiosperm. Hey, Kate, before we go on. Yes. yes. You're, you're fading in and out. Can we try uh, with you calling in and uh, doing it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Here I come. Okay. All right. It, Hi, can you guys hear me now? Oh, yes. Perfect. All right. Let's let's continue like this. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, not a problem. Sorry for the technical difficulty. I live in a tiny little rural community in um, Arizona. I've got about 3,500 members of my community. And uh, we don't have very good internet access. Okay, so flowering plants. Flowering plants are the ones that people are generally most excited about. Are you guys hearing feedback here? Yeah, uh, are, is your uh, computer muted? Okay. <laughs> Let's try that again. Let's try that again. All right. So flowering plants make okay. colored. Okay, now you're soft. Okay. Um there you go. Okay. Okay. Got echo. I think she needs to mute her computer. Yeah. I It's muted. Yeah, it is muted on mine too. All right, how's that? That that sounds good. All right, so what I have done is I am muted on my screen and my computer itself is actually muted. Okay, great. Okay. We figured this out, I think. All right, so um, we have flowering plants and as I said, flowering plants are angiosperms. Angiosperm means an encased seed. And so that seed is actually covered with something. And that something in the case of an apple is the apple flesh. In the case of wheat, it's a wonderful little kernel. Um, these are things that people eat. And so we paid a lot of attention to angiosperms. Angiosperms have an incredible variety of flowering types that you will see. And a lot of that depends on how they're pollinated. So here you see um, a wind pollinated plant and you can see that all the anthers are hanging down here, dangling in the wind, as opposed to plants that are fertilized by insects. Um, and the plants a lot of times will meet very closely with their pollinator and evolve so that they're, they're just perfectly pollinated by a particular insect or animal. I wanted to give you guys a closer look of what I'm talking about when I talk about naked seeds, the gymnosperms and angiosperms. And basically seeds with a casing are our angiosperms. So here is an apple, clearly that's a casing. There are seeds in the center. 
Um, those seeds are nicely contained within the fruit, and the fruit is a form of getting those seeds spread around. In the gymnosperm, we have our naked seeds sitting right here on one of the, the scales in this pine cone. And as the pine cone opens up, it's ready for fertilization. The windborne pollen can then land here on a scale, join with the egg and form a lovely seed, which will then blow away in the wind. So we've got angiosperms, gymnosperms. Now we have the next division in angiosperms because remember there are thousands of angiosperms and we've got to keep them straight somehow. So one very clear division they made is between something they call a monocotyledon and a dicotyledon. A monocotyledon has a single seed leaf. A cotyledon is a seed leaf. In other words, very early on, a seed will send out this leaf. It looks a little bit different than the um, grown-up leaf, and it will use this leaf to cap start capturing a little bit of energy from the sun and manufacturing food. Your cotyledon also serves as a food source for the developing embryo. So both these have cotyledons. Monocotyledon have a single cotyledon dicotyledon have two. You will probably hear the term eudicots, eudicotyledon. That is because there are some difficult plants that have managed to have more than one cotyledon. These are pretty unusual plants to run across, um, and I think that eudicot is not really used a whole lot unless you're in the scientific community. So monocot, dicot, is a little bit of an old-fashioned way of looking at this, but I think it's the way that most people are familiar. So we're going to continue with the monocot dicot division. Getting closer look at the monocot dicot, it's not just the cotyledon that distinguishes them. A monocotyledon has parallel venation, even in the grown-up leaves. Everything is parallel, as opposed to a dicot which has got what we would call a netted configuration. In other words, you can see that the veins go up and then some come across. You have a lot of net-like look to your, your veins, your vascular system. Other differences between monocots and dicots, remember we had the two cotyledon versus the single cotyledon. We have narrow leaves with parallel venation versus a net-like venation. Your vascular bundles, okay? I talked about your vascular system. That's your piping system. The piping system in a monocotyledon, look at those long, straight parts of the vascular system. If I cut that in cross-section, you'll see that they're scattered throughout, whereas if I were to cut this bottom of this leaf called a petiole and cross section here, you would see that your vascular bundles are arranged in a ring. So very different arrangement here. The other change difference between these is that in monocotyledons, you have all your flower parts in multiples of three. In fact, if you look at the stigma, which is the female part of the flower, in a monocotyledon, you will find that it has three lobes on it. So even the stigmas are in threes. So you will see one, two, three leaves, and then one, two, three, four, five, six sepals. So three or six divided by three, that's what you're looking for in a monocot. In a dicot, your flower parts are going to be in multiples of five or multiples of four. This particular flower is in five parts. So one easy way to try to classify a monocot and a dicot in your mind is to think about corn and beans. Corn is a monocot. We know what corn looks like. We can picture it very clearly in our head. So think of this single cotyledon in a corn kernel. 
you will note that that corn kernel, you cannot split it in half nicely with your fingernail. You can't, you can cut it, but it doesn't easily separate into two pieces. That's because we have a single cotyledon. Whereas if you were looking at a bean plant, for example, your bean is going to have two cotyledons and you'll be able to split that bean or that pea. Um, your dicots will easily separate into two pieces. I wanted to talk a little bit about what factors influence plant growth. No matter where that plant is growing, that plant has to survive right where it is. Plants do not get up and move. So it's all about your location, and a plant is adapted in many different ways to each location that it grows in. So one of the things that influences plant growth is light. And humans are extremely bad judges of light. It's not our fault. It's just the way we're built. A plant has a much better idea of where it wants to grow than perhaps you or I might. We may think the plant looks great in our house, right in a particular corner, but the plant may not get enough light in that location. And the plant will let you know by having some indications of low light. It may start yellowing. You may get leggy growth as it tries to find a light source. So as we look at light, we can break light down into the quantity of light. Is this a plant that can stand in the sun all day long or does it need partial shade? The quantity of light, how much light is it getting every day? The quality of light is also important. Is it getting filtered light that's coming through a lot of leaves? Is the quality of light impacted by the fact you have a wall that's casting a shadow or maybe other tall trees that are blocking the light? So we have quantity, quality, and duration. How long, uh, how many hours of daylight? So for example, most of your vegetable gardens are going to thrive if they get six to eight hours of sunlight a day. Um, other plants, that may be too much for. You may have shade-loving plants. Temperature really impacts where a plant can grow. That's one of the first things I look at when I go to the nursery and pick out a plant. I may love the plant, but after looking at its, its temperature range that it can withstand, I may have to put that plant back because in my area, I get some frost, as I know you guys do in Williamsburg, snow perhaps, when we're lucky, um, and those things influence where a plant can grow. I've spoken to people who choose to grow plants that perhaps don't fit very well in their climate, in their yard. Bless their hearts, I don't have that kind of energy in my life. I would rather plant a plant that I don't have to baby too much. I'd rather have a plant in my yard that I know will grow in that particular temperature. Temperature impacts the rate of growth of a plant. Here in Arizona, when it gets very, very hot in the summer, plant growth actually shuts down. And we, some plants actually enter into what we would call a summer dormancy because it is too hot for them to grow. Temperature influences when a plant goes dormant. Temperature can influence germination as well. The quality of water and the amount of water is highly important for plant growth and water in a lot of forms. So a plant responds to humidity in the air. It responds to the climate, which is how much rainfall they're getting. It responds to soil moisture. How much moisture can your soil actually hold? And you all will be having a soils class and learning a lot more about soils. Soils are pretty fundamental. Um, to where a plant grows. I would say that probably the climate and the temperature is the primary decider of how well a plant's gonna grow. The secondary factor is your soils. So soils and soil moisture are very important. And the quality of water. If you have poor quality water, if there's a lot of salt in your water, some plants will not tolerate it while others have adapted to be able to thrive in salty conditions. Nutrients need to be readily available to the plant, and that's readily available generally from the soil, either dissolved in the moisture in the soil or available through uptake in the soil. 
And as I mentioned before, those plants can't move. So they're going to need to find all those components that are just right for that particular plant in the location you select to plant it. I want to talk about plant growth being controlled by hormones. Here are five fairly common hormones that are found in plants. And these hormones all do slightly different things. And sorry about that. They do things uh, to the plant depending on the target. So to talk a little bit about ethylene, I'd like to start out. Ethylene is a gas generally, and you find it to be very active in fruit development. We may have all utilized ethylene without realizing it. If you go to the store and you buy green bananas and you'd like those bananas to ripen up, you might put an apple by them or in a bag with an apple. Now, what happens as a plant is ripening its fruit is that ethylene is exuded. And so a ripening apple in with your banana will exude ethylene, and that ethylene will result in your bananas turning yellow, beginning to ripen a little bit more fully. I'd also like to talk about auxins. Auxins are another growth hormone. I'll mention them a little bit later um, and we'll briefly touch on that because you guys are getting ready to go prune. So auxins are important in plant growth. So what happens when a plant starts to bend towards the light? Well, what happens is there's normally a concentration of auxins near the tip of your, the growing tip of your plant. And when there's a lot of light, that pretty much means the auxins are going to migrate to the far side of the plant where they accumulate. You get a lot of auxins here, you're going to get a lot of growth here on this side and not so much on this side. Look how these cells are elongating here. Auxins control the elongation of cells. These are much more narrow cells, they're closer together. So when you have that happen, your plant actually starts to bend towards the light. That's a differentiation of the inside the protein and the enzyme the hormone that is making those plants grow because i love fall and because we all have pictures of fall leaves in our heads just thinking about them i wanted to talk to you about abscisic acid which is another plant hormone this particular plant hormone helps a plant form what's known as an abscission layer an abscission layer is basically a scar that forms and allows the plant leaf to then fall from the tree without leaving an open scar. An open scar would be leave the plant veins, all the, the pumping system, open to bacteria entering here and disease entering the plant. We don't want that. We want to enter dormancy quietly. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start putting down an abscission layer by having a concentration of abscisic acid right here. And this forms very gradually. And what happens as it forms is the plant begins evacuating all the nutrients that they can utilize out of the plant leaves. So you'll see that the green first disappears from around the vein. These are the pumping system, remember? And to remove all that, that's where you're gonna first see the green start leaving. And so all those wonderful colors are showing you that the abscission layer is forming. Once it has formed, the leaves will fall off. Abscission layers also form with ripening fruit. That's why you can tell on an apple, if that apple is ripe, you can slowly rotate it in your hand and it'll come off of the tree. That abscission layer is formed. That fruit is fully ripe and ready to leave the tree. I wanted to mention, and this is probably <laughs> a little simplistic for everyone, but evergreen trees also form abscission layers. Evergreen trees also lose their leaves. Um, they may not lose them all at one time, but they lose them. So everybody gets abscission layers formed. I mentioned the balance of energy when we started. Well, now we're gonna talk about it in more detail. There is a balance of energy between the roots and the shoots of a plant. Plants store their energy in their roots and their stems and sometimes in their leaves. Any change in the balance forces a response. So 
So in other words, if you were to have damage to your tree, say in a big windstorm, a large branch fell off, you would expect to find that your root system dies back in response until the plant can once again establish that balance between the top and the bottom. That vascular system is how the plant maintains that balance by keeping the vascular system open. So you've got lines of communication, you've got lines of minerals being moved up and down, water being moved up, and food from the plants being moved down to the roots. So when we transplant a plant, you know, no matter how careful you are, you may be damaging some roots or how many of us have pulled a plant out of the pot only to have the whole root ball fall apart. My goodness, what are we going to do about that? We have basically damaged some of our roots. What we can do is selectively do a little bit of light pruning to kind of offset and help that plant reachieve the balance between the roots and the shoots. You can tell when that cutting that you took has rooted successfully because all of a sudden you're going to start getting top growth. In other words, the roots have developed. Now they're looking for the balance in the top and getting top growth. So in our basic anatomy, I am really irritated by this particular bar up at the top. But um, anyway, at the very top of here is a terminal bud. It's also called an apical bud. And that apical bud up at the top helps control growth. I want to talk about these areas in between the buds. The buds are found in an area they call a node. In between the buds is called the internode. And this particular bud is sitting here in this angled area. That's an axillary bud. So you have an apical bud and an axillary bud. I also want to point out that this little piece is called a petiole. This on your leaf is called the blade. And those are just some basic vocabulary, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. You can see that I have a wonderful purple vascular system that goes throughout the plant. Let's look at those vascular systems. On the left, we have what's called xylem. And xylem is the largest pipe in the vascular system, and it transmits water and dissolved nutrients one way up to the top of the plant. The important thing to know about xylem is xylem cells are heavily reinforced with lignin and cellulose. And the other thing is xylem cells, once they form, they die. And so this is just a tube inside the plant, like a straw. There's nothing to block the flow of water in between these cells. And the flow of water continues up to the top, come back, over here is the phloem. Phloem is living tissue. It's a little bit more narrow. At the end of each phloem cell are holes. So it's like a sieve, a semi-permeable sieve. And you can see that you have two-way traffic here. You can have food and dissolved nutrients and polysaccharides, hormones, proteins, all kinds of organic molecules. They're going up and down the plant, depending on where they're needed. These are living cells. They, we want these cells to have as much support as they can, so they're going to hang out pretty close to the xylem. In cross-section, this is what they look like. You can see the larger xylem cells and the more narrow phloem cells. The phloem cells are very close to the xylem to give themselves some strength. And this entire area here is called a vascular bundle. Roots. Roots have wonderful fibrous, fibrous nature to them that allows them to exploit a lot of soil material and be able to get nutrients and water from a bigger area. So they are basically holding on to the soil very tightly here. They are exploiting all this area and utilizing all the nutrients they can get. Um, and I wanted to just briefly say 
what do you guys think these are, monocots or dicots? Let's look at the blade. We have a narrow blade. I can tell you it's grass, so it has parallel venation. It has a fibrous root system. This is a monocot. What do roots do in plants? Well, their first role is to anchor and support the plant. They absorb water and essential nutrients. They send that water up to the shoot and keep the leaves fully hydrated so they're standing up tall and able to intercept the light and make photosynthesis. They store water and food. The other thing that these roots do is they form a symbiotic relationship with soil microorganisms. So the soil microorganisms kind of aggregate around the plant roots in an area we call the rhizosphere. I also want to point out at this point that although the top and the bottom are in balance, they are not equal. They are in balance. So in other words, you may hear that the top of the plant equals the bottom of the plant. I'm here to tell you that isn't true. Um, we've got a lot more roots here on the bottom to support this lush canopy up here. So they're in balance, but they are not equal. They're not mirror images. If we get down and start looking at the anatomy of the root, one of my favorite structures in a root is something called a root cap. Now the root cap is going to be at the tip of each one of these roots. And at the root cap, there is an area called a meristematic zone. Meristems are areas where you get a lot of cell division going on. And this is one of the areas in the plants that you get a lot of cell division going on. Another one would be that apical bud, remember, at the top of the plant, and the axillary bud in the axle of the plant, in those, those places where um, you have branches coming together. Now, one of the fun things about the root cap is that it actually manufactures slime. And that slime helps it go through the soil and helps it grow without getting damaged by coming into contact with the sharp soil particles. The other thing the root cap has is wonderful gravity detecting cells. They can tell which way um, gravity pulls. And for that reason, the roots are growing downwards. Without those gravity detecting cells, those roots might be growing in other directions. I wanted to point out that we have these fine hairs located on your roots. These are root hairs. You get a lot of these in areas where you have nutrient poor soils and they, they're they just trying to, to get a little bit more volume and a little bit more area in the soil to try to find some of those nutrients that may be hard to find. These are also what you have to be so careful of when you're transplanting um, your plants. And these are where most of the damage takes place. And a lot of us may not even notice it because they are so fine. The amazing rhizosphere. The rhizosphere, as we talked, is the area surrounding the root of a tree. Now, what makes this area so wonderful is because all of the microorganisms and macroorganisms in the soil get very close to the plant. In fact, sometimes they even grow into plant cells. This is a fungal that is growing right into, fungus is growing right into these plant cells. These little tiny things here are bacterias. So the plant is actually feeding these. It's exuding lovely little sugars through here, and the bacteria and the fungi just eat it all up. It's not a one-way street, though. Those fungus and the bacteria are breaking down things in the soil so that they're more easily uptaked by the plant in a usable form. I want to also mention that sometimes in the rhizosphere along the roots, we get these little nodules forming. These nodules that are forming here are actually places for nitrogen-fixing bacteria to, to live in. So I can tell without looking that this particular plant is in the mustard family because the mustard family, the Brassicaceae family, is a family of nitrogen fixers. So in other words, you can use um, members of the nitrogen, members of the uh, 
Casey family as a cover crop to increase the nitrogen in your soil in between crops. The other thing to keep in mind is if you're growing a nitrogen fixer in the soil, like a legume, which fix nitrogen, um, those guys are not going to need fertilizer. And Casey made a goofy mistake. I really apologize. I meant to say <laughs> that they were the legume that that uh, are the actual ones that have nitrogen fixing. How silly of me. It's not Brassicaceae, it's Davinaceae, which is all of the Legumaceae families. They've changed their name on them. That's no excuse. It's early. That's no excuse. I apologize. <laughs> so we'll have to move on from there. One of the things about this wonderful rhizosphere is what we're finding out Fairly recently, in the last 10 or 15 years, there have been a lot of studies in this, and they're finding that in a forest where you have plants growing closely together, the mycorrhizae, which are the fungus that form along plant roots, actually communicate between different plants. So these mycorrhizae, these fungus, they grow along the plant, they enter some of the plant roots, they're sharing some of the nutrients that the plant's providing, and they're growing through the soil. And they are expanding the breadth and depth that the roots can enter. They are helping the plant grow more healthy and strong, and they're helping the plant communicate with other plants. Now, this is a, a real exciting um, finding, and they're finding that a lot of times plants of the same species, we're just going to pretend these are the same species, are able to share their nutrients between themselves. So let's just say these are both Norway spruces. This Norway spruce right here is interacting with this other Norway spruce and giving it a lot of material that it might need. Now suppose this Norway spruce was attacked by an insect. And that insect is burrowing into the bark, is exploiting this, is eating the plant. The plant has a chemical response to this injury. And the chemical response can render its bark so that it's exuding a lot more sap. And that sap exuding is going to slow down that insect movement. So what's happening here is this plant is chemically in stress. And that information is communicated through these roots chemically. And let's say again, this is another Norway spruce right over here. That plant, which has not had any insects so far, will then begin to have the same characteristic and will increase the amount of sap to thwart those insects as they come over. The similar thing would happen if these were both beaches and you had insects eating all of the leaves here. These leaves would develop extra tannins, which would make them taste bitter to the insect. And that information would be communicated through this wonderful mycorrhizae network to this other, remember I changed this into a European beach this time, and it's also gonna develop that same tannic flavor that the insects will not like. So in this way, plants are communicating. Um, it's a chemical form of communication, so it's not really any communication that we might recognize, but yet it helps the plant's overall survival. There are three types of roots in the world, um, and one of the roots is called the taproot. It has a very strong tendency to grow downward. Um, it's one of the first parts of the root that develops in a seedling. Um, we have deeply taprooted root plants out here in Arizona. It, one of them is a mesquite, and their taproot can slowly grow to a depth of 90 feet. It's <laughs> pretty amazing. And that happens in response to a declining water table. So in other words, you have water here that the taproot is in con contact with, and as that water slowly um, drops down over time, that plant will try to grow um, to reach it. 
And in those circumstances, they can grow quite deeply. Now, if something were to happen to that taproot, it is not the end of the world for the plant. The plant at that time can start to develop a fibrous root system. So one of the reasons I'm mentioning this taproot so strongly is when you go to a nursery, you want to go to a reputable nursery to buy your plants. Because some of you may notice when you remove the pot from your plant that you're getting a lot of circling of your roots. In other words, the roots have been in that pot too long. That pot should have been, um, the plant should have been repotted to a larger size to try to prevent that. What can happen over time, the roots growing in a circular um, direction like that can slowly strangle your plant. And it's not a good, strong root system, which we all need. Um, typically, you find dicots having a tap root. Your monocots are more the fibrous root. Um, one nice example of a monocot besides a grass would be a palm tree. Palm trees are monocots. They have parallel venation. They have a single cotyledon. And they have a very, very fibrous root system. This allows that palm tree to hang on during intense storms. We've all seen pictures of hurricanes and seen those palm trees just whipping in the wind. They're not being pulled out of the ground because they have this very, very, very strong root system. Um, also, if you think of, of grazing animals eating grass, um, we don't want all of the grass to be torn up by the roots. So this fibrous root system helps the grasses hold on. The last type of root we have is something called an adventitious root. Um, those roots are out for adventures. Adventitious is a root that is growing from someplace you wouldn't expect a root. It's growing from a leaf or from a stem. This tissue isn't generally where roots come out, but adventitious roots are roots that can grow from a node um, as happening here, and they allow us to take cuttings of plants. So adventitious roots are very much our friend. Um, this is a prickly pear here in the center, a cactus we have out here in Arizona. And we're able to take a pad from a prickly pear, which is above the ground, and let it harden off and then expose it to the soil, and it will develop a root system. Another form of adventitious roots are buttressing roots that you will find. This is a strangler fig right here, and it sends up roots like this um, that help anchor the plant. Um, they also help the plant surround other plants. Um, they can also be used in reproduction to grow new plants. So adventitious roots, they're having a lot of fun. They're having an adventure. Okay, what do stems do? Stems are basically holding our leaves up to light. You remember it's all about reaching light. It's all about having the light to make photosynthesis, to take carbon dioxide and water and create sugar molecules and oxygen. Um, your stem supports your leaves, your buds, your flowers, and your fruits. They transport the food and water. They produce new living tissue from your buds. Your buds have meristems in them. Remember I mentioned that meristems are areas of rapidly developing cells, and that helps growth. And these nodes, remember, that's where the buds are forming. Those nodes are where you're going to be looking for your adventitious roots. So when you go to make a cutting, um, don't just cut off in the inner node and expect something to happen. Be sure to include a node in your cutting so you can get some development of your roots. Your stems of your herbaceous plants are going to be soft and not woody. Herbaceous. Herbaceous is another one of our botanical terms, and it means it is a non-woody plant. Corn is a herbaceous monocot. Remember that monocot dicot that we talked about? Well, I'm beating it into your head again. Here we have corn, herbaceous monocot. Look at the vascular bundles scattered throughout the cross section. The monocot stem is fairly flexible. This is a dicot over here, and the dicot has a vascular bundle in a circle, cross section here. 
An extreme stem would be a trunk. Your gymnosperms and your dicots have lovely woody trunks, and the trunks develop with bark and a cambium layer. It's a thin layer of cells that have the xylem and the phloem, and they're just inside your bark. It's important to know that your vascular system is so close to the outside of your bark because sometimes you'll be asked to go and diagnose a problem with a tree. You may find that some of the bark has been removed or is missing. If that bark is missing all the way around the tree, you've effectively cut that piping off. Without a good piping system, without their, their vascular system, plants are going to die. A plant will be uh, set back a little bit if it's got damage to its bark, but it can survive as long as it's not completely severed. So something to think about when you are asked on a plant call, what's going on with my plant? As I mentioned, plant growth occurs in those meristems, and where are they? Well, they are up in the apical bud, this top bud here. They're in the axillary buds. An axle is um, Latin for armpit. So if you imagine this is an upside down armpit, there's an axillary bud right there. The tip of the roots have meristems so they can grow. And also this circular meristem right here is where the plant will put on girth and get a little bit thicker. Buds are undeveloped shoots and they grow into flowers or leaves. So these particular bud right here um, would grow into a leaf. Sometimes you will find flower buds. The difference is a flower bud is going to be significantly larger. Um, this is a woody plant right here and it's a perennial. And its two buds are nicely covered with a kind of a leathery scale. This allows those buds to be protected during dormancy when you're going to get some cold temperatures. In the spring, as these buds begin to swell, those scales will fall off. And now those buds are a lot more sensitive to frost. So any of you who have had to go out and cover up your flowering peach tree or your flowering apple or whatever type of um, fruit tree you might have, you're going to realize you're doing that because those lovely leathery scales are missing dots on it. Um, another thing is I hear you guys are about to do your pruning class on Thursday. Yay, I love pruning. Um, this is one indication of when it's time to prune, when your buds begin to swell just before bud break is a good time to prune. Um, you can prune after bud break. It's not as perfect, but um, it still works, so no problems there. I wanted to talk about this apical bud. I've been hitting on it a bit and hinting that we were going to talk about it. That apical bud here controls the growth of all the axillary buds that are below it. It does this through auxin concentration. Remember, auxin is that plant hormone. So there's a high auxin concentration up here by that apical bud, and that prevents these side buds from developing. So if I want my plant to bush out a little bit, I'm going to remove that apical bud. As I remove that apical bud, there is no longer any auxin that is holding back these buds from growing. And the effect of the auxin as you move down the stem becomes less and less. So the further I get away from the top, the more I'm going to possibly get some growth on these guys down here. Now, you're going to be asking yourself about this time. Wait a minute. I saw that slide where the auxin made those plants' um, cells elongate more so that the plant bent towards the light. Well, what you're seeing here is you're seeing that you have different tissue. Different tissue is going to respond to the plant hormone in a different way. So this, these buds respond differently than other parts of the plant. Let's talk a little bit about leaf function. What the leaves do? Well, the main function of a leaf is to 
have photosynthesis occur. So they absorb the sunlight. They've got a lot of chloroplasts. In fact, there are going to be much more chloroplasts on the surface of the leaf than they are on the bottom of the leaf. Sometimes leaves are used for storage, like in an aloe plant. You'll get a lot of um, storage of all that wonderful um, mucilaginous gel that you can put on your burns. That's all being stored in leaves, and that was all created through the miracle of photosynthesis. Um, the other important portion function of the leaf is that it allows gas exchange. Basically, a plant is breathing through its leaves, and it's breathing through a structure called a stomata. I'm going to talk about transpiration. Transpiration is sort of like perspiration. It's the loss of water from a leaf. And what's happening is those little stomatas are opening in the leaf and allowing gas exchange a little bit of water leaves too. Now we talked about the veins and the leaves. The veins are part of that vascular system, remember, of the phloem and the xylem, the xylem being the larger tube, the phloem being the smaller tube, the larger tube carrying the water, the smaller tube carrying the sugars and all of the organic molecules. Let's look up close and personal with this leaf because I think it helps us understand how things work. So here is your upper surface of the leaf. Sometimes you will find hairs on this leaf. Sometimes you will find a waxy cuticle to try to keep moisture in your leaf. Here's your, your cells here and around your cell. Remember we had the vacuole in the center of the cell where you have a lot of water. Um, and then you have your chloroplasts that surround that. These down here are guard cells that are on either side of the hole in the bottom of the leaf called a stomata. The stoma are the stomata are working together. There are two of them. Each guard cell is um, part of the stomata. And stomata, stoma is Greek for little mouth. So remember we talked about those vacuoles. This is your guard cell right here, and you can see this white area is the vacuole. That vacuole is actually doesn't have very much water in it right now. Without the water, this stoma is closed. So when a plant's under water stress, that little mouth shuts. When a plant is fully full of water, that little mouth can then open. And the plant is able to control this opening through the entry and exit of water through that vacuole. Remember I told you those vacuoles were, were kind of fun and they helped the plant kind of um, control almost movement, if you would. So basically your water vapor and your oxygen exit through, enter and exit through this hole. Um, temperature, wind and humidity can affect how much water can be lost through these stoma in a big wind. Um, it's going to really dry your plants out if their stoma are open because all that wind is going to pull that moisture-laden oxygen out of the stomata. Mostly, stomata are open in the daytime. However, in the desert, we have some plants that it just doesn't make sense to try to be open in the daytime because it is so darn hot that we are not going to be able to, to control our moisture content. We're going to lose a lot. So we have to be able to keep them shut in the daytime. And they do that via a, a different metabolism pathway for their photosynthesis. I'm not going to go in a whole lot um, into the difference in, in plants in the desert because you guys don't live in the desert. <laughs> so. Let's talk about transpiration, because transpiration is important wherever you are. In some places, you will hear talk of evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is evaporation and transpiration taken together. Now, as you remember, transpiration is like perspiration for a plant. You're having the 
moisture basically leave the plant through those holes in the leaves, through the stoma. And it's basically a process that pulls the water up. And if you were to look very closely at a water molecule, you would see that it is not, it's not, um, it's not perfectly smooth. They stick together. They form a loose bonds between them. And as the evaporation occurs at the stomata, that water is basically pulled, almost like pulling a string through the plant. So you lose water through a plant by something called transpiration. And transpiration helps drive that movement of water up through a plant. You wonder what makes the water go all the way from the bottom of the roots up sometimes 300 feet or more through the leaves. It's because we have transpiration going on and a little bit of that water being pulled, it pulls it all the way up the plant. So botany is fun because you have so many sciences coming together to make these plants work. So you have chemistry, you have a little bit of geometry, the way these fit together. Um, you have some physics, you've got movement. So all these sciences are coming together in botany. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about desert plant adaptations, except to let you know that plants are remarkably adapted to where they evolve to grow. They have a lot of characteristics that make them able to survive in a particular environment. So the biggest issues in the desert are intense sunlight, heat, and lack of water. How have desert plants responded? They've responded by having small leaves or leaves that are merely spines um, on cactus, um, very thick leathery leaves. When they get a drought, we get a lot of leaf drop. They have more water storage in their roots, sometimes water storage in their stems, For if you think of a cactus. Um, they'll have hairy leaves to try to provide some shading on that leaf. They also grow very slowly, desert plants. You can make them grow faster if you water them, but it doesn't always lead to a healthy plant. You'll also find that in the desert, this particular tree is called a Palo Verde tree. It's got green stems, so the stems are photosynthetic just like leaves. So this plant could lose all of its leaves and still be making energy. I want to talk about forest plant adaptations. Some things you're going to find in forests are going to be very different than what you would find in the desert. Um, for example, in a forest environment, you have a lot of growth and you have a lot of decay. You have fairly acidic soils. And so these plants are very accustomed to those types of soils. You get, you get a lot of plants growing upon other plants. That would be called an epiphyte. It grows on the plant. In other words, its strategy is not to grow itself up to that height, but to hitch a ride and grow with the plant. You get a lot of leaves with different angles on them. It's being able to capture light that may be somewhat dappled as it comes through the, um, the canopy. You get more vines. Um, sometimes in areas of heavy rainfall, like in a, in a, in a tropical forest, your leaves may angle a little bit and have drip tips. In other words, to keep the rain off the tip of the roots, you'll have a drip tip. Conversely, you may have plants that capture the rain in the center like a bromeliad so that, that they can get water that way. Okay, so now it's about time to stop for a little break and um, ask if there are any questions. HB, we did have three questions in the chat box, so I'll start with the first one. It said, in reference to the family tree picture you had up, it seems like they're always changing names and family of plants. What's the major reason for this? Is it DNA analysis? A lot of it is DNA analysis, and really, some of the, the biggest changes have happened starting since the 80s. Um, there is actually an international group <laughs> that is the, um, I forget the name of it, but they're, they're all about botanical nomenclature. 
and they meet and they argue and they present their sides and they decide whether or not a plant needs to change. So yes, many, many things are changing because of DNA analysis. Um, we're learning more and more and we're learning perhaps some plants we thought were related are no longer related. Good question. Um, all right, our next question. It seems insects and animals are going extinct every day. Is that the same with plants? Yes, it is the same with plants. Um, a lot of times the plants do not get the top billing that some of our animals get in terms of um, being endangered species. People know that, for example, tigers are endangered, but they don't often know about plants that are endangered. Um, I don't know, maybe the plants just don't get as good press, but a lot of the things that are driving plants to extinction are climate change, habitat loss, um, humans as we move into places, we disturb areas, and sometimes we have plants that can only grow in a very narrow range. So um, on the other hand, there are two angiosperms that grow in Antarctica, and I was just reading how um, their populations are just starting to zoar as the Antarctic warms up. So it's gonna be a mixed bag out there. All right, our next question. When I move my ficus tree, it drops many of its leaves. I've heard that this is due to stress. Can you elaborate? Ficus, I have found to be really sensitive to light. Um, you move your ficus tree and the light condition has changed for it. So you're going to get a lot of leaf drop. I've also seen leaf drop in my ficus, even though I haven't moved it because the season has changed. You know, the sun is, is moved a little bit. And so it's not getting the same exposure as it once did. So that is something to anticipate and expect that your ficus will do that. If you have it in an area where it's getting enough light, then it should recover fairly quickly. If it doesn't, perhaps you may have moved it to a place where it's just not getting enough light. All right, thank you. Anybody else have a question that they'd like to type into the chat box real quickly before we take our break? Or you can type it in while we're taking our break as you that think about it. Sounds That'll like work it. too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, when okay. I get back from break, I can take that. Okay, great. Okay. So Let's take a, a 10 minute break then. Um, okay. And be back at, um, what's it? Um, what, 28 past the hour? Or do you want to yeah. go to just the half past? Yeah, half past is great. Let's come back at half past. And, and Kate, be a question for you. You keep talking about a black bar. I don't see any black bar. Is there something I can do for you? I oh, mean, we, thank goodness. I'm yeah, really yeah glad no, we just see, see I just see your. I just see your brief. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Because I okay. see, I see the whole unmute, stop video, security. That whole bar is at the top oh. of my yeah, screen. We don't, we don't see that. And, thank you. I'm so glad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what a relief. Well, All right, we'll, we'll come back. All right. All right. See you soon. Normally, the ones of on the lower branches. I've noticed on oaks and beech trees in my area. So the deciduous trees not losing all their leaves. Okay, so your deciduous trees, the abscisic acid that starts forming, um, those hormones are acting in response to temperature and light and a lot of different factors. So. A tree is not going to lose its leaves if it's not getting the cold weather to help trigger it. And so a lot of times those trees that drop their leaves are going to wait a little bit longer. Um, it's all because of it's not getting the cues from the current weather conditions, if that's helpful. Yeah. Hey, can I, um, I, I, know, I know white oaks are ones that um, they'll hold on to their brown leaves. They just won't drop off. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's typical, I think, of white oaks. I'm not, I'm not sure, but that's how I tell a white oak tree. Okay. Um, 
there are conditions that that are very bad <laughs> um, that cause a, a plant to die very quickly and do not allow that plant to drop its leaves. So you have it as a natural condition in your white oak. You also have the condition where perhaps you're going to have a horrible disease called Texas root rot that attacks the roots of your plant and it kills it very, very quickly. And one of the characteristics of that is your tree may within two or three days, all the leaves turn brown and they're still on the tree. The tree has died very quickly. Mm. It takes a while for the decision layer to form. And that tree has died so fast, it wasn't able to form an incision layer. It didn't have time to pull all the nutrients out of its leaves. It just died that way. So there are those bad conditions that happen. But as you say, there are some that just hold on to their leaves a little bit longer than others. Um, it has to do with the different plants. But generally, if I see a tree that is fully leafed out, and all the leaves are brown, I can tell that there's a major problem going on with that tree. So it's a, it's, it would be an indication and a chance to call a master gardener out to your house and say, what's wrong with my tree? Are there any more questions? I don't see any others. So I think we can go ahead and get started with the uh, second half of your presentation. Perfect. Here we go. All right. Um, photosynthesis and respiration. I thought it was important to discuss this a little bit. Um, photosynthesis, as we all recall, is how we capture the sun's energy and form a sugar molecule and have oxygen as a byproduct. Respiration can be considered almost the reverse of that. We are going to take that oxygen molecule and we are going to break down those sugars and we are going to get our energy from that. Respiration is what animals do to break down the sugars and the other organic molecules that, is, were, that are being eaten. So in this picture, we have a cow. He's nicely eating the grass, which is happily photosynthesized and form some good compounds to help the cow grow. And the cow is going to take in oxygen and is going to put out carbon dioxide. So see, it's almost like the reverse of the reaction that happens with photosynthesis. But I wanted to pause here and let you guys know that a plant also will take its sugars and break them down and use oxygen to break them down to get the energy. And then that energy is then used to form other molecules and perhaps join other sugar molecules together with some nitrogen and make some good protein, um, just basically fuel the engine. Now, fortunately, a plant is going to produce more oxygen than it uses in respiration. And because of that, we have some good oxygen in our planet to breathe. But I wanted to mention these photosynthesis and respiration, the back and forth between these two. Okay. Now we're going to get into the weeds a little bit on leaf descriptions. I'm going to be talking about a lot of terminology. Um, botany is full of it. It's full of terminology because plants are so different. There is such a big, wide variety. So I'm going to start here at the leaf margin. The leaf margin is this area along the outside of the leaf. Now, this particular leaf margin is called an entire leaf margin. You can see there's no break. Now, this one is a serrated margin. It looks kind of like a saw right here. Here's one that's lobed, and here's one that's undulate, kind of like a wave. Why am I telling all this? Well, when you want to find out what a plant is, because that's generally the first thing you have to find out when you're looking at a plant, what is it? What's it related to? When you have that information about what plant it is, you know growth practices, you know watering practices, you'll know the diseases, you'll know 
the problems that this plant can have. So our whole job is to try to get enough terminology so that we can figure out what a plant is. So you have this little stem coming out. That's a petiole up here. This is the blade of the leaf. So we have blade, petiole, margin, and different types of margins. Leaf descriptions and how they're arranged on the stem. Okay, so now that we've had a little bit of botany under our belt, we could probably tell whether something is an angiosperm or a gymnosperm. And if it's an angiosperm, we can tell whether it's a monocot or a dicot. These leaves all look like dicot leaves to me because of the shape of the leaf. Um, I expect them to have a net-like venation here. These are dicots, dicotyledons, two cotyledons. Now we're going to look at how are the leaves arranged on the stem. This is one of the first things as you look at a plant, you can narrow it down. And now I'm going to decide whether the leaves are arranged in alternate fashion. It's on one side of the stem, then another, then the other side of the stem, then the other. Those are alternate leaves. Or if they're opposite, see how they're directly across from each other? Or if they're whorled. Whorled leaves all come out of the same node, and really there ought to be a fourth leaf over here that you really can't see and another leaf out this way. But for the purposes of showing you what this looks like, this was the best picture we could come up with. And here you've got a node here, and they're all coming out of the same node. This is called a whorl, a whorl. At the base of each leaf is a bud. This is something you can write in stone. At the base of each leaf is a bud. If there is no bud at the base of the leaf, then it is a leaflet. These are called simple and compound leaves. A simple leaf has one leaf and there's a bud. A compound leaf means that I have a bud here and I have many little leaflets. Pinnate means small, pinnately compound leaf. This one is called a palmately compound leaf. If you can imagine that this was your palm and that this particular place was the wrist, you can see that everything comes off of the palm. Palm trees are like these. The fan palms are like these. You can tell that these are not individual leaves because there are no buds right here. So you look for the bud at the base of each leaf. Leaf descriptions go on and on. Leaves are very, remember the leaf is your tool for catching the sunlight. And so they're gonna have a lot of different strategies in that leaf. You have different types of leaf tips. Remember I mentioned that in um, your rainforest, you can have a leaf tip that allows the water to drain off the leaf so it won't sit on the leaf and maybe cause a disease. Um, they have different names for these. I don't expect everyone to remember all these names, but I think it would be a good idea to commit a few things to memory that you're running into. So linear leaf. Now that is a fairly straightforward leaf to try to understand. Um, it's long it's narrow, it's linear. Lancelite leaf is shaped like a lance. Um, chordate, like a heart. Oval leaf. You can see there's a lot of terminology here and you could maybe make yourself a little bit crazy coming about what these are. If you look, for example, here's an ovate leaf and there's an obovate leaf. You can see how they're kind of the opposite. This has got the narrow tip here. This has got the narrow tip at the base. So there are all these different types of leaves out there, and they are lots and lots of words to describe the leaves. Guess what? There are little hairs on leaves. They're called trichomes, and the trichomes can take on amazing shapes. These are just a few of them here that I just put out just to show you guys. Um, as you imagine, each one of these shapes has a different name. It's kind of mind-boggling. What do these trichomes, these leaf hairs, do? They're shading the leaf. They're deflecting the wind. They are helping the leaf survive in the environment. As I mentioned, we're all about trying to decipher what is that plant. 
we can narrow it down. We know what angiosperms and gymnosperms are. We know about monocots and dicots. The next question that usually comes up is what is the plant habit? And by that, they mean, is it a tree? Is it a shrub? Or is it a vine? Now, again, these are terms that humans came up with. And hmm, plants didn't realize these names were out there. They have not got any kind of uh, cut off or whether it's a shrub or a tree. <laughs> you could be something in between. And what you are may depend on what part of the country you're living in. The next thing to ask yourself, is it deciduous or evergreen? Sometimes we're going to have to watch that tree for a long time. Other times we just kind of already have a feeling. You know, that pine tree is really evergreen. And if the whole leaves all turn brown, we've got a problem. So evergreen. Um, mainly they're holding on to their leaves throughout the year. They may drop them and change them over very quickly. Uh, in Arizona, we have a live oak that is evergreen in the springtime, the leaves start turning yellow, that abscission layer is forming, and the leaf falls off, but oh, they never go completely naked because the leaves grow back very quickly. So deciduous or evergreen, is it, we mentioned whether it was a monocot or a dicot. We're looking for um, dicots are going to have net-like leaves. Monocots are going to have parallel leaves. Monocot is a single cotyledon. Just like grass, dicot is two cotyledons. Remember that pea that you can pop it into two pieces or the bean that pops into two pieces? So corn or beans, what does it look like? Is it an annual or perennial? All right. These are also words that humans have come up with to describe plants. An annual will complete its life cycle in one year. That means that it grows and it blossoms and it sets seed and it's finished. A perennial is going to hang around for at least another year. It may grow one year and then bloom the next. Flower descriptions. There's a whole lot of words for the flowers. Remember all the leaves we talked about, the shape, the arrangement, the arrangement, even if you don't have the shape name, a lot of times the arrangement will start to get you in the ballpark of the plant. If you have an alternate leaf, if you have opposite leaf, or if you have a world leaf, those things are going to help you narrow down what that plant is. And finally, if we're lucky enough to get a flower or seed or fruit, we can use that in our description to try to figure out what the plant is. In the big picture, what a plant wants to do in its life is to capture and store enough energy to survive and reproduce. It needs to outcompete its neighbors. It needs to adapt to whatever environment it is. And sometimes that environment changes throughout the year, or perhaps someone will plant another plant next to it. That environment can be changeable. It has to adapt to herbivory or being munched upon. It has to be able to survive when it is eaten and used as a food source because plants are, in general, food sources. Did I mention that the plants need to reproduce? It is one of the compelling drives of a plant to try to produce the next generation. A lot of times there are plants that if you keep slightly stressed, they will bloom more because they're trying to ensure that the next generation occurs. So reproduction is the primary aim of every plant. And here we have a lovely spider plant that has a whole bunch of pups. Now the spider plant has long linear leaves and it has parallel donation. I imagine that it would be a monocot, and I hope you all guess the same thing. Inflorescences or flowers. Flowers are modified leaves. Their purpose is to attract um, a pollinator. So you have a lot of nice colors here. You have yellows that are very popular with the bees. You have reds that are popular with the butterflies and with the hummingbirds. So the colors depend on your type of pollinator. And there are colors that your eye and my eye can't see, but that can be seen by bees or birds or the pollinator. And sometimes bees almost look like landing strips to direct the, the insect into where the, uh, the pollen and seeds are located. 
So let's talk in general about plant reproduction. Plants often have a choice in reproduction. It's not really a conscious choice, but they're able to reproduce asexually and sexually. Some of our fiercest um, weeds are able to um, reproduce both ways. For example, um, Bermuda grass, which is either uh, a blessing or a curse, depending on whether you have a Bermuda grass lawn or whether you're trying to grow a flower bed and it's being invaded by the Bermuda grass. Bermuda has, um, will seed very easily. It has above ground stolons. It has underground rhizomes that will branch off and start a fine new plant. Now, the difference between asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction has to do with what type of offspring you're going to have. Asexual reproduction, you're going to have an identical plant to the first plant. All the offspring are identical. They're basically a clone. So if you take a cutting, you're basically cloning that plant. You're making an exact copy. So it's a disadvantage because they're all genetically identical, but it's also an advantage because you have a successful plant. It was able to reproduce, and it's made an exact copy of itself. So depending on how you look at it, there are blessings in asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction allows the combination of two different plants with two different sets of, of genes to come together and to create a further different plant, a plant that's different from either one of its parents that shares characteristics of both. So these genes from the different plants are going to give us a lot of good variability. That variability is good when you have to withstand a disease or when you have to withstand a, a change in condition or some type of stress. Those genes allow uh, a little bit of variety in the hope that that one of the species will be able to, one of the plants will be able to survive in that environment. Talking about the parts of the flower, um, hopefully you guys have some familiarity with this, but if you don't, these are not complicated and uh, pretty straightforward. Okay, so the female part of the flower is called the pistil, and it's this center portion right here. And this is a, an idealized flower. Um, they come in slightly different shapes, but pretty much these are the female part of the flower. The eggs are kept here in the ovary. This is the stigma, which is a sticky top, and that sticky top acts to attract the pollen and make sure it stays there. There's a tube that leads down to the ovary called the style. The male part of the plant is the stamen right here, which consists of the anther and the filament. The anther is the sac that holds the pollen. The filament holds the pollen sac up high so it can be reached by your insect pollinator. I'm going to mention the receptacle here, and you're going to remember it a little bit later. It's this, this slight swelling underneath the, um, the flower right here called the receptacle. You have sepals which are generally green and are the outermost set of leaves. Then you have these petals. Together, this colorful petal is known as the corona. Um, and each grain of pollen is kind of like a tiny plant. So the pollen is produced in these anthers. And each pollen grain consists of two sperm cells, if you will. When it lands, when the pollen grain lands on, on the stigma and is stuck in all the stickiness here, one of those sperm cells grows a long tube that reaches all the way down into the ovary. At that point, the other pollen sperm enters into that tube, goes down into the ovary, and joins with the egg, and we have a fertilized seed. So that is how each grain of pollen is sort of like a tiny plant because it lands here and it grows down to the um, ovary. It may be helpful for you guys to visualize how some of these structures came into existence in earlier days. So 
if you want to think about an early stamen, early stamens were probably born right on the leaf and they would hold pollen. Over time, that stamen began to change until we ended up with a filament and anther that we have today. If you look at how the ovules actually started, here you would have them born on the leaf. They would be just nakedly out there without any covering, but the leaves started to change and encase the seeds. By encasing the seeds, they're better protected. They're not so exposed to the elements. This is what you would call a carpal, and that word is not particularly important, but what is important is this is the development of an angiosperm. No longer are those little ovules just naked out there. They're covered in a carpal, and that slowly formed to form the stigma and the style, and there's your ovary down below. And so when your seeds are fertilized, they are encased in a casing, and that makes this an angiosperm. I'm not a person who likes to point fingers and talk about being perfect and imperfect, but way back when, um, people started using these terms to apply to flowers, and you may run across them, which is why I'm bringing them up. Okay, so a perfect flower is considered to be a flower that has both the, the stamen and the pistil. They have both the male and female parts of the flower. This would be a perfect flower. Now, there are some flowers that will just have the stigma or just have the stamens. Why would this be? Well, remember we talked about asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction works best when you have two different individuals that are providing genetic material, two different plants. If in this condition, I may accidentally self-fertilize myself and end up with a plant that doesn't have quite the genetic diversity that, that would be um, advantageous. So plants develop different methodologies for trying to avoid this happening. One of those would be to divide their flowers out so that you have imperfect flowers, male flower, male flowers, and female flowers separately. Okay. Um, avoiding being able to pollinate yourself can be important. Look how high the stigma is as opposed to the anthers. That's another way that a plant tries to avoid that. Okay, other terminologies talk about complete and incomplete plants. A complete plant has got not only both the male and female parts, but it's got the sepal and it's got the petals as well. And don't forget that little receptacle that we're going to talk about in a minute. An incomplete flower, one of those parts is missing. In this one, it happens to be the anthers. It could have been the sepals are missing. It could have been the petals are missing. It could have been that the um, pistol itself was missing. So incomplete just means one part missing. So we have these terminologies, perfect, imperfect. The perfect and imperfect are only referring to the male and female parts of the flower. Perfect having both, imperfect only having one. Complete is referring to all four of these components here and one of them being missing, old terms. Now I'm going to get into something that can be a little bit tricky. So um, I'm going to talk through it, and if you have a question, put it in chat, and we will go over it again. There's a term called monaceous. Monaceous means one house. Just to mess things up, um, there are some different ways of spelling this. Sometimes it's spelled monoecious and sometimes it's monoecious. In Arizona, we are still using the older term monoecious. I don't know what you're doing in Virginia, but I do want you to know it's the same word whether or not it has an O here or not. Um, monoecious or monoecious means one house. That means a plant has 
both male and female flowers on the same plant, that plant could self-fertilize. It's not necessarily going to, but it could. So an example would be um, squash. Squash has both sets of flowers on it. And in the summer, usually the male flowers come out first. So you may be getting flowers on your squash and you may be asking yourself, why do I only have flowers and there is no squash being formed? Well, you are having just the male flowers being formed and the females haven't formed yet. So wait a little bit, the females will form, and then the male pollen can fertilize that. So some places they've come up with a term they call synesis, which means that you have both male and female on the same plant, but they are perfect flowers. In other words, all components are here. Now, I would just keep with the term monaceous and diaceous. There's enough words to figure out in botany. Monaceous can also refer to this particular circumstance of a plant having a perfect flower. So in my mind, that's still one house. Diaceous means two houses. I need two plants in order to get my seed. This is very true in um, a lot of different plants, um, including... Um, I just drew a blank. Oh, here we go. Avocados. Avocados, if you have avocado fruit forming on your tree, you have a female avocado tree. And if you have your fruit forming, you can guarantee there's an avocado within pollinating distance. So it takes both these plants. This strategy allows you to completely avoid any type of self-fertilization. There's no way that this plant can fertilize itself because it's just female or this plant can fertilize itself because it's just male. You have to have both parts of your flower. You have to either have a perfect flower or imperfect flowers, but both on the same plant to get self-fertilization. But a lot of times that's not the preferred methodology. This is like a last resort for the plant. Most flowering plants require a pollinator, and they have some really specific ways to attract them. They have wonderful scented petals. They have nectar sources within them. So they give the bee, in this case, a little bit of a reward to come through. They have their anthers sitting up high and they are positioned so that the insect comes into contact with them. They stick all over their body. And when they crawl around this plant, they're going to be able to fertilize it. Okay, I wanted to talk about a different type of, of pollinator. This pollinator is a hummingbird. And deep down in the throat of this flower, there's nectar. This hummingbird has to stick his head practically inside this flower. And as he does it, you can see the anthers right here on his head. So his head is going to get covered with pollen. And as he backs out, he's going to hit the stigma and he's going to do some fertilization right there. So that is pretty cool. I wanted to mention that I read very recently about blue columbine that they found in Colorado. Now, columbine has a, a long spike towards the rear, and usually that spike is where the nectar glands are. Well, they're finding that there are blue columbine that don't have the nectar glands. And the botanists were kind of wondering what the heck was going on. In a population of blue columbine, some of them will have those spurs with the nectar and some of them won't. Well, through study, they found out that the ones with nectar were being browsed by deer. The deer were eating them and they were eating so many of them that the columbine was having trouble reproducing. So in response to that pressure, the flower structure changed a little bit. So I think that's very interesting to know that flowers not only change their structure to fit a pollinator, but also to avoid being eaten. Pollen. Pollen is amazing. You know, it, it looks like just little dust, but when you look up close, um, the nooks, the crannies, the shapes, when you talk about anthropology, 
and they're going deep in pine and they're finding pollen grains, they're able to use the pollen grains to identify the plants, which is just miraculous that they can even look at something this tiny. These are under electron microscope. I wanted to talk about pollen because sometimes it gets overlooked. It's so small. But pollen has its own sensitivity. You may notice that certain times of the year when it is very warm, your tomatoes are no longer setting fruit and you're wondering what's happening. Well, what's happening is pollen, just like every other part of the plant, has certain temperatures that it survives in and temperatures that it does not survive in. So what's happening in the summer to your tomato plants, if they're not setting their fruit, is that your pollen is actually dying because it's so hot. And I don't know if you guys have got conditions like that in Virginia, but we get them routinely in Arizona. Um, so interesting to think about pollen um, and the fact that such tiny little structures on the pollen are what allow it to attach to the different insects and survive. Flower types. Guys, there are so many words to describe flowers. And I tried to find some examples um, that I thought would be fairly common and fairly useful. Uh, I could have I could have devoted a whole day to talking about different flower types that you guys all would have fallen asleep. Um, I want to point out a couple of different flowers you're going to run into. Single. Boy, I can I can get behind a single flower. Um, I see what that looks like in my brain. Um, I can also probably get around a, a panicle. You know, this is a kind of a long, uh, very full type flowering inflorescence or a spike. The umble, you can remember umble because it's like an umbrella. Um, see how these come at the same point here? This is a compound umble because you've got two here. Um, those are the ones I would tend to remember, that and composite. Now, a composite flower is like a sunflower, and composite flowers are many, many, many flowers collected in one. You have these ray flowers, which are generally imperfect. In fact, many of them are completely sterile. And then you have the ray flowers in the center, which will have your, um, your stigma and your pollen, everything there. So composite is a fairly large um, grouping of plants. It's one of the biggest ones out there, and you're going to see composites all over the place. And a great deal of them are yellow. In fact, um, when I was in grad school and we were trying to identify plants, we used to call some of these composites DYCs, damn yellow composite, because you couldn't figure out what it was and you could only get it to that level. The point is, flowers come in a wide variety, and it takes a lot of energy. Why is the plant investing this much energy into the flower? Because reproduction is one of the driving forces behind plant growth. Look at all the different kinds. So as we look at these, I can see, all right, this one here looks like a spike to me. Uh, this is an umble here. There's a composite. So some of those flowers, it would, it would probably behoove you to do a little bit of practicing on some of the more common shapes of flowers to be able to describe them when you run across them. This type of flower is called a cyme. What happens is all of the little flowers come off of one side of the stem. This is formed in what they call a helix and um, yeah, helicoid, helicoid cyme. So what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of different descriptions. You may be reading a plant description and come across a word you don't immediately recognize. Know that it's probably trying to describe one of the many uh, hard to describe parts of, of plants. Grasses have flowers too. Let's not forget that. Grasses are angiosperms. They have flowers. Grasses are monocots, but they do have flowers. Okay, they're wind pollinated. They don't need to look particularly beautiful, but I wanted to point out, look at these anther sacs dangling in the wind. These little feathery parts, those are actually 
the pistol, the stigma right here. And they are just out there ready to catch any little piece of pollen that floats by. So because they don't have to attract insects, there's not a lot of color going on. Um, I pulled this one up because there's no scent or nectary, and I wanted to get the opportunity for you guys to practice a little bit. Is this a monocot or a dicot? You're actually missing one of the stigmas here. They didn't put it in because it would have disrupted their very nice pictures, but these are in threes. So even if I didn't see the blades of the grass to see that they were parallel the nation, I would still be able to see one, two, three. This is a monocot. Let's talk about fruit. <laughs> Remember we said there were so many different kinds of flowers and inflorescences? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of fruit too. Um, they roughly divide them into fleshy fruits or dry fruits. And again, these are human areas. And we could argue they want to call um, beans a dry fruit, beans and peas. Uh, okay. Um, I think maybe what we're looking at here for the beans and peas being dry is that their seed pod is not very fleshy. Although I've been known to eat snow peas right in the pod. So let's just back off and, and talk about fleshy fruit. Uh, being like apples and berries and pineapple. So a simple fruit, you had one ovary, you had one flower, like in a peach or a tomato. An aggregate fruit is when the, mold, when the ovaries have fused together with just one flower. Raspberries and strawberries are like that. Multiple, you have multiple fused ovaries with multiple flowers. So multiple, multiple for pineapple and fig. Accessory fruits, accessory fruits are like apples. Apples have are simple because they have one ovary, one flower. But what happens in the apple is you remember that receptacle that we pointed out? That receptacle is what actually grows up around the ovary. There's a receptacle right here that quiet little unassuming part of the fruit and this receptacle is what surrounds the ovary which is really that center part of the apple and an apple is called a poem and it's called a poem because it has this center area here and the receptacle all around it so apples and pears and asian pears are all poems as well as quinces Dry fruits, like legume, the pod, the fruit is really the pod, it's split. These are actually the seeds inside the pods. And you remember these seeds are dicotyledons because you can easily split them in half. A coreopsis would be a single seed fused to a carpel, like in corn or a dandelion. Now, corn and dandelion are very different because corn is your monocot and dandelion is their di dicot, but they still call the fruit similar name for both of them. And then we have a big category we just call nuts. Uh, we have a single seed. Every now and then there's two. The ovary wall is very hard or woody, and the seed actually becomes stuck to it and has to be removed. There are a lot of different names for different fruits. And again, I didn't want to um, put everybody to sleep by going over them. All the different ways that seeds disperse themselves um, have a lot to do with the type of fruit that the seed forms, if they form any type of fruit. So remember we talked about the dandelion that was the single um, seed, a keen and they are distributed through the wind. And so they have these structures that catch the wind. If you think about your maple, those form almost like a little helicopter as they go around, as opposed to some of these lovely burrs that we find on like cockle burr um, growing, and they hook onto animals fur, and the animals carry them far away and distribute their fruit everywhere. 
animals eat blackberries. Humans do too. And uh, a lot of times birds may eat a berry and then pass the seed someplace else. Water dispersal. These lotus flowers float on the water. A coconut is an amazing type of arrangement to preserve the seed inside of it. If you think how coconuts float between tropical islands, that seed has to withstand all that salt water and be battered around before it finally lands on a sandy beach and it can sprout and form a coconut. Some seeds burst open when they are ripe. So we have a, a plant called a fairy duster out here that as it bursts open, seeds go everywhere. So if you want to collect seed for your fairy duster or for a plant that bursts open like this, you may have to put a paper bag around here um, and wait for it to burst and then give you a nice paper bag full of seeds. Humans are perhaps some of the best seed dispersal mechanisms out there. We move seeds everywhere. We plant seeds. We grow things. Uh, and there are some who would say that the plants have uh, more or less manipulated us into um, taking care of them and growing them, providing them everything they need. Okay, here's some more of those wonderful terms. Just to show you a glimpse of why I didn't go more in depth into this. Okay, so I want you to know that all of these with the one are a type of berry. So you have a simple berry like a tomato. You have a berry that has a very hard rind, like a pumpkin. That's called a pepo berry. And you have berries that have leathery skin and their interior is divided by membrane. That's a hesperidian. So those are lemons. Droops are stone fruit. And I mentioned droop because you're probably going to hear that a lot. They basically have a single solid fruit pit in the middle, like cherries or peaches or nectarines. Homes are accessory fruits. They have that receptacle that we mentioned already. And aggregate fruits, like a strawberry, where we have several ovaries fused together. Gymnosperms, remember, they have naked seeds, so no fruit on the gymnosperms. Instead, we have a seed that develops. Now, someone is going to say, wait a minute, I've had pine nuts. I've eaten those. I have too. A pine nut, you're actually eating the seed. You're not eating a nut. You're eating the seed. It should be pine seed. <laughs> but at any rate, that's what you've got there. Seeds, getting to seeds. Seeds are the most resilient phase of a plant's life. Um, I mentioned that they have seeds that they've found in Pharaoh's tombs that they've been able to sprout and have grow. There are seed repositories. There's a huge one up in Sweden um, where it's nice and cold, and they their goal is to have seeds of every plant in the world uh, with the idea that, um, if necessary, they could bring back a plant from extinction if they had to. They would have the seed force to be able to do that. Seed anatomy. Remember we talked about we talked about ferns. Ferns were very simple and they had spores rather than seeds. Seeds are much more um, complicated than a spore. A spore is just a single cell, but this seed is many cells and it has many different layers. It has a very strong seed coat. The seed coat helps protect the plant and there are a variety of chemicals in the seed coat that inhibit growth until conditions are right. How does a plant know when a condition is right? Well, some plants, some seeds respond to environmental factors like fire. Without fire, a lot of these seed coats will not crack open and the seed will not grow. Water, um, we have seeds here in Arizona in wildflowers that wildflowers don't come up every year. They have an inhibitor in their seed coat. Enough of that inhibitor has to be washed out by rain that the seed can then germinate. The seed is trying to make sure that when it grows, it's growing in an 
in a condition where they're going to have enough water. Light, some seeds germinate when they're very close to the surface of the soil. They're getting enough light. Temperature, day length, all these can trigger germination. The whole goal is to be able to get the plant to grow and these first leaves to come out and start photosynthesizing before you use up all your seed reserves. So if you store your seed improperly, it gets exposed to moisture, and perhaps it's a, it's a seed that just you soak it in water like bean, and it'll start germinating. And what will happen is it'll use all of its food before it can germinate. If you bury a seed too deeply, it will use all of its food before it can get its leaves up through the soil to start making its own food. So what, how do we know how deeply to bury a seed? Well, a rule of thumb is to take one and a half times the longest dimension of the seed and bury it that deeply. Sometimes you get very, very tiny seeds, and you may have to mix them with sand or perlite or vermiculite, something to help you spread the seed a little bit more easily. If you think about all the energy that a plant puts into reproduction, you can tell yourself why we're deadheading plants. We deadhead and remove spent flowers to encourage the plant to put out more flowers, to invest more, because we've per we have basically stopped this plant from processing these seeds and getting these seeds all the way right. So if you wanted to have your Mexican blanket flower to be around next year, you would probably let some of these ripen all the way, um, probably towards the end of the season. Plant habit. Well, this is an interesting slide because I actually modified it for your class. Um, as we live in Arizona, um, I live in Arizona, the difference between a tree and a shrub can get a little blurry out here. Our trees don't generally reach much higher than about 20, 25 feet tall, and they frequently have multiple trunks. And so some of the, the ways that you would tell whether it was a tree or a shrub are very blurred out here. And so it, what the University of Arizona did is they pretty much said there's a cutoff. And they tried to say, all right, so your shrubs are woody, just like a tree is woody. They have multiple stems at the ground, and they're only about 15 feet tall, whereas trees would be taller than 15 feet. Well, you know, as I, as I looked on the internet, I saw that Typically, other places in the world where there's a lot of water and they have really tall trees, trees are really defined as being 20 to 30 feet and more. And your shrubs can go up to 20 feet. So I did modify this. Um, the trees and shrubs are both woody plants. Your herbaceous plants are generally non-woody. And they're usually low-growing. Vines are, you can have some woody vines and you can have non-woody vines, but they basically climb up another plant. They're, they try to use another plant for support. Um, some of our, our vines are able to climb somewhat over themselves, but the concept is these guys have not invested a strategy that gives them a, a firm, tall base to grow up into. So your plant habit, that's what these guys were talking about here. Your rule of thumb for root depth, and that's one reason to start thinking about plant habit is to try to get an idea of how deep you ought to be planting your plant. Now, trees, typically about three feet deep, shrubs about two foot, and your annuals, perennials, and biennials about one foot. Now, ideally what you're going to do is you're going to use the, the height of your, of your pot that your plant's growing in and the actual distance between the earth top of your plant and the bottom of the pot for your depth of hole. But when you want to know how deep you want the water to go, this is where the roots are going to be concentrated in the top three feet for a tree and the top two foot for shrubs. And what I do to check the water penetration is I have a thin piece of rebar um, you can also use a rod, and I push it into the ground. If, the, if it passes easily through the soil, the soil is moist. 
and when it stops is usually where the soil water has not penetrated any further. So by pushing my rod through the soil and feeling what kind of resistance, I can tell whether or not my irrigation system has to be modified, whether I have to increase the duration to get further penetration in the soil, or whether I water it a little bit less because perhaps I'm watering below three feet. And to water too deeply is basically to waste your water. So you want to water up by the roots. All right, more people definitions that plants don't always fit into. Annual. I think I mentioned earlier that an annual will complete its life cycle in one season. This is in here right here. Um, biennial is going to last a couple of years. This is a um, box club here. It usually will, will grow the first year and kind of uh, get its vegetative growth up and start getting the energy together to reproduce. And then a perennial, this is a saguaro cactus, um, it grows and reproduces each year. Now, having said that, nice, clear, easily understood definitions, you will find out that some perennials don't reproduce annually. And some perennials act like annuals in cold climates. Um, you know, a, a lot of our vegetables, like, for example, um, kale. Kale could grow for more than one year, but typically we use it as an annual and we take it out at the end of the year. So again, these are people um, definitions that don't always fit a plant, but you're going to run into them and people are going to talk about them, and so I wanted you to be able to understand what they are. Aha! Now, the dreaded taxonomy, all that lovely Latin. Well, first of all, let's get some warm feelings going for, for Carl Linnaeus. He is the father of modern taxonomy. He's also called the father of botany. And boy, this guy knew his Latin like I don't. Um, he basically was fascinated by plants from a very young age. And one of my favorite stories about Linnaeus is that when he was a young a youngster, and he started to throw uh, what we would now call a timber tantrum. Um, perhaps he was unhappy about something. What his caregivers and parents would do is they would provide him with a plant. They would just give him a plant. And he would almost instantly stop hollering and start looking at the plant because he was so interested in the plants. So you got to like a guy who likes plants that much. Basically, what he came up with was a system of classifying plants based on their observable characteristics and putting them into categories. And he came up with this whole idea of plant kingdom, animal kingdom, and then working your way down. Nowadays, we're up to five different kingdoms because we have studied and learned so much more about the organisms on Earth. We're able to see that, gee, we should have some single-celled um, organisms in one category and other organisms in other categories. But basically, for our purposes, we're talking about the plant kingdom. Now, the plant kingdom, as you go down this, if you think about this, is, is a very big funnel, and it gets smaller and smaller as it goes down until you finally have these last two, the genus and species. If you have the genus and species of the plant, you know exactly what kind of plant that is, and you know its name, and I can go to Africa, and I can see a hop bush, which is a Dononea viscosa, and it's growing in Africa, and I have it growing in my yard in Arizona, and I can talk to somebody about it, and we're talking about the same plant, and that's exciting. So the family is really where a lot of plants information is categorized because plants in the same family act in similar ways. They have similar requirements. They have similar diseases. They have similar cultural practices. So we want to have an idea of what plant family we're in, and it gives us an idea of how to grow our plants, which is what we're really all about. 
So each plant is uniquely identified by a two-part name, consisting of genus and species. The genus is always capitalized because they decided that a long time ago, and the species never is. So it's like the first part is capitalized, the second part isn't. The genus, when I get down to genus, I may have some hybridizing going on in between species of genuses, but none of the fruit will really be fertile unless it's a very, very similar genus or the same species. So the fun thing is that between species is where you get interbreeding and you have fertile offspring. Between the genuses, you may get crossbreeding and you get interesting hybrids that come up. So Quercus emrii, that is a, a lovely live oak we have here in Arizona. I'm going to start talking about the families now. And this is basically getting down to the end. We're going to run through some of the families, and I'm going to try to convince you guys to learn some of your families so that you will have a good idea of how to grow them and maybe some of the problems they might have. So you remember I talked about this type of inflorescence. It's a composite inflorescence. All the Asteraceae families have composite inflorescences. So if you see this, you have already a pretty good insight that you're in the Asteraceae family. Composite flowers, you have two types of flowers. You have ray flowers around the edges. You have disc flowers in the middle. You can see these disc flowers here are all the stamens, and these disc flowers here are all the stigmas. So this is your, your flower part here. Examples will concern, include sunflowers, artichokes, chamomile, lettuce, and many, many, many other ornamental plants. Solanaceae. Aha, you've probably heard that ACE part. Well, not so long ago, they decided that all plant families would have ACE at the end. So instead of the composite family, which I memorized, this is Asteraceae because they wanted to keep with the Latin naming. So they named it Aster rather than composite. And my brain is still working on that. Solanaceae is the potato family, also called the nightshade family. The flower parts are in fives. They usually have a tubular corona. You can see that this is a tube here. The petals are all fused somewhat to some degree. And in this petal case, we would count these little horns, one, two, three, four, five. So five parts there. A lot of edible fruits and tubers come out of the Solanaceae, eat, like the tomato and the potato and the eggplant and the bell and chili peppers. However, Solanaceae is also known for having poison, poisonous plants like tobacco, belladonna, and this is Datura here. Um, some of our landscape plants, Solanaceae, like petunias, and that shouldn't be angle. It should be angel. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> angel trumpet, which is a very pretty one. So just like you wouldn't eat a green potato because that would have toxic compounds in it, all of these Solanaceae families have a certain degree of toxicity associated with them. So, um don't eat the petunias. Lamiaceae is the mint family. Um, the mint family is highly known for its aromatic compounds. And one of my favorite parts of the mint family is they all have these square stems. So if you're growing a sage or marjoram or basil, you can put your fingers between the stem and roll it and you can feel that it is square. And what a fun thing that is to be able, somebody gives you a plant, says, what is it? I'm spinning it in my hands, hoping it's a mint, so I can just tell them it's a mint. They also have what they call a two-lipped flower, bilabiate flower, um, top and bottom, a little difficult to see here. But uh, a lot of lovely ornamentals here, a lot of good herbs, a lot of uh, kitchen herbs here. Rosaceae family. A lot of different kinds of fruits grow 
in rosaceae family. You know, you've got apples that have that accessory type fruit. You have um, berries. You have droops. You have pomes, which are your apples and pears. So the rose family all have five petals and sometimes many, many um, stamens and uh, just one pistil or multiple pistils. Um, they have many spirally arranged stamens. The flowers are in spikes or heads, um, racemes. You'll have to go back and look that up, see what you can remember on that. Um, at any rate, lots of wonderful members of the rose family. A lot of your fruit trees are in the rose family. I'm mentioning this because you guys have a pruning class coming up. And members of the same family get the same diseases. Catesby had on her rose bush a lovely gall that was growing, and I pruned it out. And then I blithely went on to prune my apple tree. Then I pruned my peach trees. And before the next year was out, I had gall on my apple tree and my peach tree in addition to my rose bush. I spread the disease between because I did not disinfect between my pruning cuts. So guys, if you're pruning a diseased tree, remember to disinfect your pruning cuts. You can use a little alcohol sprayed, you know, in a spray bottle and just spray your your pruners in between, let them dry off a little bit and then go right on with your business. But that's one reason to know your plant family because the same diseases can get the same family members. Brassicaceae. Brassicaceaes are the mustards. And the mustards are all characterized by having an acrid or pungent juice. Their fruit is in form of a two-part capsule. Uh, they have small flowers, four, four petals, six stamens. Um, four of the stamens are tall, two are short. Um, and all these wonderful things that we like to eat, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, turnips, radishes, Brussels sprouts, and, of course, the mustards, all the breast KCE. Now, these guys don't fix nitrogen, even though I made that mistake. They do not fix nitrogen. The legumes do. Fabaceae. Fabaceae is known as the pea family. They have odd flowers, flowers that have five petals with what you would call a banner and two wings and a heel. Well, pea family also has flowers that look like a little puff ball. So like in your mimosa trees. Um, so different types of flowers here, but this is your characteristic seed pod. It has seeds in a long pod like these. This particular one is constricted. These are um, mesquite beans here, but most of your pea, all of your pea family has that wonderful pod-shaped fruit, and it's considered to be a dry fruit. Legumes fix nitrogen. They have these little tiny nodules. So if I were to pull up um, one of my legumes, a pea plant or a bean plant, I'm going to find these little guys, and those little guys are all fixing nitrogen for your plant. So you don't have to fertilize your beans with nitrogen or any of your uh, your legume families, um, you know, like a honey locust tree would also not need to be fertilized. Okay, Liliaceae. Liliaceae. Hmm. They're all in parts of three. They have parallel veins on their leaves. Don't look at this leaf right here. That leaf was just in the picture. But look at these veins all parallel. Liliaceae, these are monocots. And all the plants in this particular family grow tubers, bulbs, or rhizomes. They're very, very showy. Um, if you were to look at that stamen, I'm sorry, that stigma right here, you would see that there are three parts to that, three little sticky parts. And so very much threes, multiples of threes. So this would be a monocot. And that is it for today. And if you guys have any questions, I'm willing to take them. 
And I want to thank you for your patience. We had a couple of technical difficulties, but uh, I think it was fun. Mm -hmm. I agree. We do have a few more questions, Catesby. Um, one of them was, do you have a particular plant identification app that you find particularly, particularly useful? You know, I have not succumbed to the plant app temptation. <laughs> um, I, I guess, I guess I got started doing the old-fashioned way, and I really enjoy the process of hunting down a plant. So you give me a picture and a little bit of description of the habit and where you found it growing, and I will get on the internet and zoom it down. <laughs> but there are a number of plant apps out there, and I would encourage you to use them um, and to also double check. See just how good you think they are. Um, and if you find one you really like, let me know. Well, I, I noticed that someone else in the group answered that they use the picture this app, and that is indeed the one that I've found most useful. But I have to say that um, my neighbor asked me about a tree yesterday and every time I looked at the tree the picture app gave me a different name for it but we finally mm. we finally narrowed it down so I, I, I just caution that you can't always believe everything that comes up there you might want to try it a few different times or a few different ways very true mm -hmm. very true and didn't you feel great when you finally nailed that tree down <laughs> and you knew what it was absolutely <laughs> I get a real kick out of that <laughs> There is one other question here. Is there a way oh, way you can differentiate between a male plant and a female plant? Okay, you would look at the flowers and you're looking for anthers and you're looking for the stigmata and the, and the stigma and the style and the pistil, the whole female part of the flower. So if you see the female part of the flower, it's a female flower. If you see the male part, it's a male part. Or if you see both of them together, another way would be able to tell is, um, did you get fruit or seeds off your plant? If you got fruit off it, you know you've got at least female components somewhere. Mm -hmm. All right. One more question I see. Can you talk briefly about carnivore plants? Do they get their nutrients from insects instead of the soil? Well, they do get some of their um, nutrients from insects. Um, some carnivorous plants uh, are growing. A lot of times you'll find them in, in a tropical forest. The soils in the tropical forest are usually not the most fertile because most of the, the nutrients are tied up in the plant material. So these guys are out there looking for additional um, resources and they lure the insects in and uh, typically uh, trap them like a Venus flytrap or capture them like a pitcher plant. Pitcher plants have a very, uh, they're like one way in and they have a, instead of nectar at the base of the tubular flower, they have a, a digestive juices <laughs> where the insects fall in and get uh, eaten up. So it's a strategy to kind of um, increase the amount of nutrients that are available. All right. I think that ends it for our questions. I'll let Jen take it away. Yeah, I, okay. I have one more question for you, Kate. Steve. What is your favorite plant or plant family? You know, um, I have to say that I go back and forth. You know, I, I find a plant family I really like. I, I like the rosaceae family for all of the beautiful flowers and the fruit fruit trees. But then every now and then I find an oddball family that I'm like, wow, who knew that existed? So um, I guess I'm hard to pin down that way. Well, I think we can all understand that. I think we're probably all the same. But uh, yeah, I do want to thank you very much. That was a heavily information laden presentation and it just made me realize how much I had forgotten and <laughs> a lot more so a um, uh, lot of good comments in the chat box about you know thank you very much um, super presentation so thank you very much oh you totally I totally appreciate it and thank you guys for reaching out to me because this is what I love to do so 
thank you. And I enjoyed this. Okay, great. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, it, does right, it, well, class have any?